Psalm 135, uh, verses 6 to 13. The Lord does whatever he pleases in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the depths. He causes the clouds to rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain and brings a wind from his storehouses. He struck down the firstborn of Egypt, both people and animals. He sent signs and wonders against you, Egypt, against Pharaoh and all his officials. He struck down many nations and slaughtered mighty kings. Sihon, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and all the kings of Canaan. He gave their land as an inheritance, an inheritance to his people, Israel. Lord, your name endures forever. Your reputation, Lord, through all generations. 1 Peter 4, verses 12 to 19 says, Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you, as if something unusual were happening to you. Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer or a meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in having that name. For the time has come for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who disobey the gospel of God? And if a righteous person is saved with difficulty, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, let those who suffer according to God's will and trust themselves to a faithful creator while doing what is good. Father, we do thank you, Lord, that we can come together as your people to sing songs of praise and worship unto you, because you are our faithful God, our one true King. And Lord, we do pray and ask, O oh God, even for this time of the preaching of your word, that you would be with us and you bless us, O oh God, as we listen to your word. Grant us ears to hear, O oh God, and I pray that today's sermon may bring forth encouragement to our hearts as we think through what you have to say to us through this portion of scripture tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, if there's anything that we have learned so far from the book of 1 Peter, I believe it is this. It is that suffering is inevitable in the Christian life. Right? Suffering is inevitable in the Christian life. And that's what Peter's original readers, who were scattered across the Roman province of Asia Minor, were experiencing firsthand. And while not yet an official, state-sanctioned, government-sponsored persecution against Christians, you know, these believers were nonetheless discriminated against mistreated and maligned for their faith. And things were about to get worse. For only a few years after Peter's writing, and based on what we know from history, these believers would experience a full-scale, full-fledged assault and persecution for their faith. One led by the sadistic Roman emperor Nero, and one in which Peter, as well as his fellow um, apostle Paul, would experience martyrdom for their faith. And it was in light of this persecution that loomed on the horizon that Peter picked up his pen to write to these believers. And he wrote with the purpose of preparing and encouraging them to stand firm in their faith in spite of the hostility that they were facing or were about to face. And facing our passage this evening, after having touched on the topic of suffering at several points in the letter, Peter sort of brings all of it together. And Peter here gives us a a final word, so to speak, on suffering. And the main point that he wants us to leave with us tonight is this. Believers should suffer well for the sake of Christ. My believers should suffer well for the sake of Christ. And in our passage this evening, Peter gives us three directives on how we can do just that, on how we can suffer well for the sake of Christ. And the first directive that Peter gives us is this. We are not to be surprised by the suffering that we face instead we are to rejoice in them. Look with me at verse 12. Notice how Paul begins. He writes, Dear friends, 
You know, just as he did in the previous major section of the letter, in chapter 2, verse 11, Peter here calls them dear friends. Right? The word here is agapitos, meaning beloved or dearly loved one. And in so doing, Peter reminds them and us at the outset of our identity and status as believers. You know, we are God's beloved. We are people for God's own possession. We are the apple of his eye. And friends, that's what we need to remember as we navigate our, our, our way in this hostile and sinful world. So having reminded them of their identity, Peter then proceeds to issue this command. He writes, Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you as if something unusual were happening to you. Now, we saw this word surprised last week in verse 4 of the same chapter, where Peter says that unbelievers are surprised that we don't join them in the same flood of wild living. Right? They find it strange, they find it weird that we don't join them in what they do. But what Peter is saying here is that we should not be like that. Right? We should not be surprised at the backlash and hostility that we may face from the world for our faith. No, we should not be taken aback. We should not find it abnormal, weird, or strange. In fact, this is something that we should expect as believers. Right, three quick reasons why this is so. The first reason is this. It's because we live in a fallen, broken, and sinful world. You know, and, in a, in, in, and in a post-Genesis 3 world, a world that is marked by the fall, suffering is inevitable in life. Right, it is to be expected. It is a common lot for all humanity, and no one escapes unscathed. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that as Christians, we are in the world, but not of the world. In the world, but not of the world. You know, we've said it many times now that as certain exiles, we march to a different drumbeat, a heavenly drumbeat. And as such, we don't quite fit in with the ways, customs, and values of the world. So I'm just saying that it's inevitable that we stand out like a sore thumb as we navigate through this hostile world. In fact, Jesus himself, he warned us in, in John 15, 18 to 19, he says this, If the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. Thus, friends, it's inevitable that we will suffer for our faith in this world. But the third and final reason is this, and this is the point that I think Peter is emphasizing here. It is this, God uses suffering and trials to test our faith. Right? God uses suffering and trials to test our faith. Notice what Peter says in verse 12. He says, don't be surprised when, right? not if, but when, when the fiery ordeal comes among you to what? To test you. Right? That is, the sufferings and trials are there to test us and to refine us. And this brings to mind the words of Peter at the beginning of his letter, where he describes the purpose of trials. In 1 Peter 1, verse 6 and 7, he writes this. He says, You rejoice in this, that is in the great salvation that we have in Christ. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Did you guess it, friends? The purpose of trials including persecution, is to test and refine our faith. Right? It is to remove the dross from our faith. It is so that we may have a pure faith. James, James puts it this way in James 1, 2-4. He says, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect. Why? So that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Or in the words of Paul in Romans 5, 3 to 4, he says, And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions, in our sufferings, because we know that affliction produces endurance, endurance produces uh, proven character, and proven character produces hope. So the trust that we come our way as believers have a divinely ordained purpose. Right? God uses them to refine, test, grow, and mature us. So friends, when we suffer for our faith, let's learn to see with the eye of faith, the smiling face of God behind the, fr the frowning providence that he brings. So let's just do a uh, self-test for a moment over here. Let's ask ourselves these questions. You know, what is our response 
when we suffer, when something bad happens, or when we are persecuted for the faith? You know, do we have a framework for suffering in the Christian life? Or are we surprised, shocked, and stunned by it? Friends, if so, if you are surprised, then perhaps we have bought into the lie, no matter how small, of the prosperity gospel. That is the teaching that Christians should always be happy, healthy, and wealthy. And Peter here gives us a much-needed corrective. He says we are not to be surprised when we suffer for the faith. In fact, we should expect suffering. After all, Paul in Philippians 1.29 tells us in no uncertain terms that it has been granted to us on Christ's behalf not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for Him. So friends, we should expect suffering as believers. But not just that, we are also to rejoice in it. Look at verse 13. Peter writes, Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may also rejoice with great joy when His glory is revealed. Now, friends, it's important to note that we are not to rejoice in suffering for suffering's sake, right? We are not masochists here. Instead, we are to rejoice as we share in the sufferings of Christ. Or as the ESV puts it, as we share, uh, insofar as we share in Christ's sufferings. In other words, to the extent that we are suffering for the cause of Christ, for the sake of Christ, we should rejoice. We should count it a privilege. We should count it an honour. If you remember, this was, what, this was what the apostles did themselves. We read in Acts 5.41 that after they had been imprisoned and bitten for preaching the gospel, for preaching Christ, what did they do? Well, they went out from the presence of the San- Sanhedrin rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. Now, some people, may be, some people may be wondering, why is it a privilege to suffer for Christ and in what way is it an honour? Well, I think it is this. It's a privilege and honour because it shows our identification with Christ, our commitment to Christ, our allegiance to Christ, and most importantly, our union with Christ, that we are one with Him. And notice the purpose clause in verse 13. It says, so that you may also rejoice with great joy when His glory is revealed. You catch that, friends? We rejoice in our present sufferings for Christ so that we may greatly rejoice in the future when Christ is revealed. In other words, our present joy in suffering will give way to a greater joy in glory when Christ is revealed, when faith becomes sight, and when suffering and death is no more. And by the way, friends, I also think that this implies that our rejoicing in our present sufferings for Christ is also an indication that we truly belong to God, that we are His, that Jesus is our treasure and our prize. Simply put, it's an evidence of saving faith. You know, it's like what Moses, whom I think Ian alluded to this morning, in Hebrews 11, 25 to 26 says, Moses chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. And why did he do that? Well, for he considered the reproach for the sake of Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt since he was looking ahead to the reward. Friends, we can rejoice because our willingness to suffer for Christ shows that we are on the right path, namely the path from suffering to glory, the path from cross to crown. As Paul puts it in Romans 8, 17, if we suffer with Christ, we will also be glorified with Christ. And Peter then proceeds in verse 14 to give an example of suffering for Christ. He writes, If you're ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Right? Words that echo Jesus' own words in Matthew 5, 11, where Jesus says, You are blessed when they insult, same word for ridicule, when they, when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And so what Peter is saying is that even though the world may, may ridicule us, insult us because of our faith in Christ, we are blessed. And why? Well, verse 14 continues. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. You know, friends, this is an allusion to Isaiah um, 11, verse 1 and 2, a passage which prophesies how the Holy Spirit will be with and will rest upon the Messiah who was to come. Isaiah 11 reads, Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And friends, what Peter does 
is that he takes this prophecy that was fulfilled in Jesus and he applies it to Christians, to us. He's saying that just as the Holy Spirit was with and rested upon Jesus in his earthly ministry, so too will the Holy Spirit be with and rest upon believers when they suffer or are ridiculed for the name of Christ. You know, Paul is implying over here that when we are suffering for the faith, the Holy Spirit will be with us, will rest upon us in a unique way, in a special way. And friends, perhaps this is why Stephen could respond the way he did as he was stoned in Acts chapter 7. You know, perhaps this is why Paul and Silas could sing hymns to God in prison in spite of their present predicament. And perhaps this is why the martyrs throughout church history could respond the way they did in spite of being tortured and killed for the faith. You know, I'm not, not, not sure about you, but I sometimes wonder to myself, you know, man, I'm not sure whether I have what it takes to bear up under such torture. Will my faith hold up during such times? You know, have you ever asked myself that question before? Let's look at the martyrs of faith, how they went through this burning stick and so forth. Have you asked yourself, man, if I went in their shoes, would I recant and give up my faith just to save my life? That's what I always ask myself. And if I, oh man, I hope I can stand up for the name of Christ in such circumstances. My friends, I think what Peter is telling us here is that during such times, as we faithfully follow Christ, the Holy Spirit will rest upon us in a special way. God will sustain us, God's grace will be sufficient, and God will enable us to stand firm to the very end. So how are we to suffer well for the faith? Well, Peter's first directive is that we're not to be surprised. Instead, we're to rejoice when that happens. Peter's second directive is this. We are not to be ashamed of our sufferings. Instead, we are to praise God for them. Look at verses 15 and 16. Peter writes, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in, bear, in having that name. Right, what we see here is that before Peter issues the command not, for us not to be ashamed, he first issues a qualification. And he gives the qualification, qualification in verse 15, where he writes, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a meddler. You know, I think what Peter is doing here is to make sure that we understand that he is not talking about suffering because of our sins. Whether blatant sins such as murder or thievery, or not so blatant sins such as like being a meddler or a busybody. You know, there's nothing blessed and nothing Christian about suffering because of our sinfulness or because of our foolishness. For example, you know, if we break the speed limit and are fined for it, that's not Christian suffering. If we do drugs and are caught, right, that's not Christian suffering. If you're obnoxious, if you're obnoxious and are shunned because of it, that's not Christian suffering. Right? That's not suffering for Jesus. Peter puts, puts it this way in 1 Peter 2.20. He says, For what credit is there if, one, uh, if when you do wrong and are beaten, you endure it? Answer, none. In fact, we should expect them, for that's what we deserve. So with that in mind, we do well to evaluate our sufferings and ask ourselves, you know, is the suffering that we're experiencing, is it a result of our sinfulness and foolishness? Or is it the result of our faith, of our being followers, of Christ. Friends, we must ensure that when we suffer, we are suffering for the right reasons, that we are suffering for the sake of Christ, that we are suffering as Christians. And that's where Peter goes next as he issues the command. Look at verse 16. He writes, But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. In other words, if we suffer because of our sinfulness or foolishness, we should be ashamed but not if we suffer for our faith. Now, friends, it might be worth noting that the term Christian here in the first century was not the term that believers used to describe themselves. You know, this term, which occurs only three times in the New Testament, was actually a derogatory term coined by pagans and applied to believers. As such, there was a stigma attached to being a Christian. It was a shameful thing to be a Christian, well, at least in the first century's honor shame culture. And the call for us here, whether in the first century or in the 21st century, is not to be ashamed to identify with Christ, to make a stand for Christ, or to suffer for Christ and the gospel. So with that in mind, a good question we can ask ourselves at this point is this. You know, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our public spheres, are we ashamed to be called a Christian? 
Are we ashamed to be identified with Christ? Are we ashamed to make a stand for Christ and the things of Christ? Friends, if so, perhaps we need to be reminded of these sobering words of Jesus in Mark 8, 38, where he says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. What convicting words these are. So friends, as Christians, as children exiles living in this hostile world, let's resolve by the grace of God, as Paul puts it in 2 Timothy 1 verse 8, to not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, but instead to share in the suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. But friends, Paul doesn't stop there. Right? Not only are we not to be ashamed, we are also in verse 16, to glorify God in having that name. And how we need to hear this in this day and age where Christianity is increasingly under attack. Friends, contrary to how the outside world may view us or uh, treat us, we have to praise and glorify God that we bear that name. You know, we have to be proud of it, we have to wear it as a badge of honour, and we have to bear the reproach of Christ as a privilege. You know, as we saw earlier in Acts 5, 41, that's what, the apostle, that's what the apostles, including Paul himself, did when they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. In other words, they glorified God in bearing that name, they wore it as a badge of honour, they bore the reproach of Christ as a distinct privilege. So Peter, in exhorting us to glorify God in having that name, is not just talking the talk, but he's actually walking the walk. And friends, as a practical side note, you know, perhaps it helps to remember that when people ridicule or reject us, they are not, in an ultimate sense, ridiculing or rejecting us per se, but Christ. For we are but his spokespersons, his representatives. When Jesus puts it this way in Luke 10, 16, where he says, Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. And whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. And what Peter wants us to understand and drill into our hearts is this. In spite of what society may say or think, there's nothing shameful about being Christians, about being followers of Christ. In fact, it's a distinct honour and privilege to suffer for Christ. So how are we to suffer well for our faith? Well, so far we have seen that we are not to be surprised, but we are to rejoice. And also we are not to be ashamed, but we are to praise. And now thirdly and finally, Peter instructs us that we're not to be ignorant, but to entrust. Verses 17 and 18. For the time has come for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of, for those who disobey the gospel of God? And if a righteous person is saved with difficulty, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Now, note the conjunction for in verse 17. Paul is, uh, sorry, Peter is giving us here the reason why we ought not to be ashamed to suffer for Christ, or more generally speaking, why Christians suffer. Right? Peter is lifting the lid, he's removing the veil, he's opening the curtain, so to speak, to allow us to peer into what is really going on in times of suffering. He wants to give us a big picture view, a divine perspective on suffering. Right? He doesn't want us to be ignorant about what's going on. You know, perhaps Peter, being the pastor that he is, anticipates that some of us like Asaph in Psalm 73, may struggle with thoughts such as this. Hey, here I am, faithfully following and serving Christ. Here I am, making a stand for Christ. And yet, here I am, being persecuted for my faith and having so many troubles in my life. My unbelieving friends, on the other hand, they seem to have it easy. They seem to be carefree. You know what's going on? Maybe it's easier for me to give up the faith and follow the ways of the world. And so Peter here helps shed light on what's really going on behind the scenes, so to speak. And what he wants us to understand is that the reason why Christians suffer is because, verse 17, judgment begins not with the unbelieving world, but with the household of God, with God's household. Right? A term that refers to the temple of God in the Old Testament and a term that refers to the people of God in the New Testament. And so what Peter is saying here is that judgment has begun with God's people, that is, with us. That's why we experience what we experience in this life. But a question needs to be asked. What kind of judgment is this? 
You know, after all, didn't the Apostle Paul make it clear in Romans 8 verse 1 that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? Well, friends, thankfully, Paul is right. And so the judgment that Peter has in mind here is not one of condemnation, but one of purification. And most scholars believe that Peter has in mind over here, Malachi chapter 3, where God comes in judgment as a refiner's fire to purify the Levites for service in the temple. Now listen to Malachi 3, 1 to 4. God says, See, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. Then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple, to his household, the messenger of the Lord, uh, the messenger of the covenant you delight in. See, he is coming, says the Lord of armies. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who will be able to stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and a launderer's bleach. He will be like he will be like a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Then they will present offerings to the Lord in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will please the Lord as in days of old and years gone by. So what Peter is saying over here is that this purifying judgment of God comes first and foremost to his people. Right? It begins with his household, with us. And it comes not to condemn us, but to test us, refine us, and to purify us. It is to make us become the kind of people that he wants us to be. Or better yet, a bride who is without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. Right, Peter then proceeds to give an argument from the lesser to the greater, and he does this in a form of a rhetorical question. Verse 17, Peter asks, and if, this, and, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who disobey the gospel of God? In other words, if God's judgment looks like this in the lives of believers as He refines and purifies us through the sufferings that come our way, how much worse will it be for the unbelievers, for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Answer, terrible and terrifying indeed. For unbelievers, at the end of the age, will be judged. Right? They will be thrown into hell where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, Peter then reiterates this point in verse 18 where he quotes Proverbs 11.31. He writes, And if a righteous person is saved with difficulty, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Now, friends, just to be clear, this verse does not mean that it is difficult for believers to be saved or that believers are scarcely saved, that is, they barely make it through to heaven, so to speak. Right? No, there's nothing wrong whatsoever with the atoning work of Christ. Right? His blood is sufficient, his death is efficacious, and we have been redeemed fully, perfectly, and finally with the precious blood of Christ. First Peter 1 talks about that. But what Peter is getting at here is simply this. He's saying that the pathway to salvation for believers is fraught with challenges and difficulties. Challenges and difficulties that we must endure and persevere through in order to be saved. You know, it's akin to what Paul says in Acts 14 verse 22, where he says, it is necessary to go through many hardships, many tribulations, to enter the kingdom of God. And the thing that Peter wants us to understand here is this. If that is what is, is, in, if that is, what is in store for the people of God, if you are saved through the purifying fire of suffering, then the judgment of the ungodly and the sinner must be terrible indeed. You know, what awaits unbelievers is nothing less than the eternal flames of hellfire when they are judged at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Peter doesn't want us to be ignorant. He doesn't want us to be like Asaph, who before he saw the plight of the wicked, he envied their lot. Instead, Peter wants to encourage and motivate us to endure and persevere in the face of suffering. For friends, the thing is this. It is far better to face the fire of persecution that God uses in this life to purify and refine our faith than it is to face the fire of destruction that unbelievers will experience when Christ returns. In other words, Peter wants us to know the difference between the temporal judgment that believers face in this life and the eternal judgment that unbelievers will face in the next. So friends, we're not to be ignorant. And because we are not ignorant of what's going on, we can entrust ourselves to God. Look at verse 19. So then, 
That is in light of all that has been said in verse uh, 12 to 18. So then, let those who suffer according to God's will and trust themselves to a faithful creator while doing good. In fact, this, in a sense, is Peter's concluding and all-encompassing con- uh, exhortation in his class on Christian suffering. When all has been said and done, this is what we are to do as believers in times of suffering. Right? We are to entrust ourselves to a faithful creator while doing good. You know, the main verb, the main command here is entrust. You know, the standard Greek lexicon, BDEC, defines it as to entrust, that is, to give over, to command something to someone for safekeeping. But the same verb is used in 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, where Paul exhorts his prodigy, Timothy, with these words. Paul says, What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit, that is, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also, right, and trust the gospel to these men. And most significantly, it is also used on the lips of our Lord himself, who on the cross uttered these words, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Friends, just think about it for a moment. To whom will we entrust our possessions for safekeeping? You know, what kind of people do we look for to safeguard our possessions? Or put it this way, say you are a parent and you're going for an urgent trip overseas, to whom would you entrust your children for safekeeping? It's a no-brainer, right? I'm sure we will look for people whom we know, people who are faithful, people whom we can trust. And that's Peter's point over here. When Peter exhorts us to entrust ourselves, note how Peter describes God here, to a faithful creator, faithful creator. Now let's stop and think. Why does Peter make reference to God as creator over here? Well, I think it is this. In so doing, Peter is emphasizing, he's accentuating the sovereign rule, control, and power of God over all things, over the entire cosmos. Right? He is the sovereign ruler, Lord, and King. And nothing, not even the sufferings that we face in this life, happens apart from his will. And I think that's why Peter prefaces his command with these words, let those who suffer according to God's will. And what this tells us is that nothing can touch a believer apart from God's loving and sovereign purpose and control. In fact, the thing is this. Not only is God sovereign, but He's also faithful. And because of this, we can be confident that God, the faithful and sovereign creator, will not allow us to suffer beyond what we can bear. And that when we do suffer, God will provide the strength that we need to endure it. We have, we can, we have seen this many, many, many a time through the various lives in this church. Therefore, friends, we can and should entrust ourselves to God. And note this, while doing good. In other words, our perseverance in doing good, even in the face of suffering, which brings home a point that we saw last time in 1 Peter 3, 13 to 17, when this is an evidence that we have entrusted ourselves into the loving arms of our Creator and King. And friends, there's no safer place to be than that. Well, friends, we've said it before, that we are living in a world that is, to quote Elliot Clark, fast becoming post-Christian, post-truth, and perhaps even post-tolerant. And we're living in a time, in, in a world, where the Western public square, in the words of Carl Truman, is no longer a place where Christians feel they belong with any degree of comfort. And so, friends, as Christians, as children exiles living in this hostile world, we do well to arm ourselves, as we learned last week, for the onslaughts that may, or should I say, will inevitably come in the future so that we may suffer well for the sake of Christ. And friends, what better way to do that than to heed the directives of Peter that we have seen in our passage today. So friends, when we do suffer for our faith, let us not be surprised, ashamed, or ignorant. Instead, let us rejoice, praise, and entrust ourselves into the arms of our faithful God and Creator. Why don't we pray? Father, we do thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. Lord, we thank you that your word reminds us of what is true, ultimate reality. And Lord, even we do know that in this world, which is increasingly dark, O God, we can rest assured that you are the sovereign creator in control of everyone and everything, and that nothing happens apart from your will, as we have read earlier in the Bible reading. 
And Lord, we do pray and ask as your people, help us not to be ignorant. Help us, O God, to be ready and expectant of what is to come, the fiery days that may lie ahead, O God, according to your sovereign plan. Help us to be ready to embrace it and to suffer well for your sake and not to be like those who turn their back and just stop following you, O God. As Ian preached so well this morning, O God, help us to keep on keeping on in the faith. And Lord, I pray and ask, help us to know that in the times of uh, difficulty, O God, that your grace will be sufficient for us, that you will come through for us, you will enable us, O God, to press on to the very end, because your word has promised us that you who, get, you who began a good work in us will be faithful to bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So help us to rest and entrust our lives wholly unto you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.